Supporters and opponents of same-sex marriage rally in Washington and in San Diego as the Supreme Court hears arguments over California's ban. I'm Eric Anderson, a look at the proceedings and the protests tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Peggy Pico, also ahead. We find out if local schools make the grade for LGBT students. Then, San Diego County District Attorney's Office takes to the airwaves to help stalking victims. Also tonight, the San Diego airport shows off its newest security checkpoint. And San Diego's two biggest university campuses will soon become smoke-free zones. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Dwayne Brown is off tonight. California's ban on same-sex marriage made it to the Supreme Court today, but today's arguments began with some doubts from some of the justices who said they weren't sure they should even be hearing the case. Proposition 8 is being defended by those who put it on the ballot in 2008 and not by the state of California. Some of the justices questioned their legal standing, and they also questioned the premise of the ban. What, what harm to the institution of marriage or to opposite-sex couples? How does this cause and effect work? We don't believe that's the correct legal question before the court, and that the correct question is whether or not um, redefining marriage to include same-sex couples would advance the interests of marriage as opposed to... Well, then are, are you conceding the point that there is no harm or denigration? Uh, to uh, traditional opposite-sex uh, marriage couples. So no, you're conceding that. No, Your Honor, no. Court watchers say the justices could avoid a national ruling on same-sex marriage simply by dismissing the case altogether or by deciding Prop 8's backers had no legal standing to defend it. In either of those two scenarios, a lower court ruling to overturn the ban would stand. Traditional marriage supporters held their own rally in downtown San Diego today. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy was there. Dozens clutched signs and waved flags on the steps of the federal courthouse. The rally was spearheaded by a handful of San Diego faith-based organizations who vowed to keep marriage between a man and a woman. Forty states have laws protecting traditional marriage. Kathy Williams thought the moment was so important that she brought her five children. I think the future of our country depends on the strength of families and the grounding of our children in their faith. And we have a right to raise our children accordingly to our own religious beliefs. Sylvia Sullivan says she attended as a concerned citizen. They have all the benefits of marriage under their civil unions in the state of California. They merely wish to somehow or other force their views upon us. And we say what's best for the children and for society is marriage could remain one man, one woman. Protesters here say their religious values are in jeopardy. Supporters of same-sex marriage say it's about civil rights. But both sides agree it's become one of the biggest defining issues of our time. I mean, we had, you know, uh, civil rights. And we had, you know, having a disability. I was at the forefront of that when I was a kid. Um, and so I guess it's sort of been planted in my heart to uh, be an activist for, for what's right. Tamandra Michaels supports same-sex marriage. She says she brought her camera to document history. I'm just curious as to what motivates people to, to cling to their, their hate and their fear. So it, it's a fascinating subject for me, and then I enjoy writing about it. Sean Sale is a gay rights advocate with the Light the Way for Justice campaign. He says a growing number of people support equal rights. I think that as more people have come out, you know, family members, friends, soldiers, brothers, sisters, you know, people have finally realized that it was sort of a bunch of malarkey and uh, that discrimination is, is just that and uh, it needs to end permanently. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. 
PBS NewsHour will have more on today's arguments coming up at 7 o'clock. The scheduled guests include California Attorney General Kamala Harris. And you can find more of our coverage online at kpbs.org. Other news tonight, the latest round in the fight over San Diego's Tourism Marketing District. Today, the City Council passed a resolution directing Mayor Bob Filner to sign the agreement worked out last year, allowing hotels to charge an extra 2% for rooms and then use that money for marketing the city. Filner has refused to sign it, saying it's an illegal tax, and he says he can veto today's resolution. The council could override a veto. Filner says if they do, he could go back to court. He also says he and the TMD chairman were very close to reaching a deal before today's city council meeting. A KPBS I news source investigation into transit security has raised some serious questions about the guards hired to protect passengers on two local rail lines. Some guards say they don't have the training to do their jobs, and now officials with San Diego's two major transit agencies want some answers. I news source reporter Brad Racino joins us with the latest. Brad, remind us again about what the investigation was all about. It was about a lack of officer safety and contract oversight within San Diego's two transit agencies. The company under contract, Universal Protection Service, provides roughly 210 guards who patrol all the trains, trolleys, and stations throughout the county. A number of them came forward to tell us they weren't prepared to do their job, and they're receiving almost none of the training that's guaranteed in those contracts. Now, how are the transit districts responding to that? They're handling it in very different ways. North County Transit District actually audited Universal's training files in response to our story in late February. They released the details of the audit. They found all the training files were missing documentation. 26 had missing or expired first aid and CPR cards. 17 were missing chemical agent certification. None of the files showed these guys had kept up with their firearm certifications. And there was no indication any of the officers had received peace officer training, all things which are guaranteed in their contracts. Now, were there repercussions for this? Sort of. NCTD threatened to cancel Universal's contract unless the security company came into compliance quickly. According to the audit, Universal has already taken some of those steps. And what happened with the other transit agency, MTS? MTS was a bit more subdued. Uh, the board received a safety briefing from the agency's chief of police, and then executives from Universal took questions from board members. Uh, one of those members, John Minto, actually asked the executives to open their books and, and put a lot of these concerns to rest. Universal's president agreed and said that he would, uh, but we'll wait and see what happens with that. Brad Racino of iNewsSource. We will have more of our coverage online at kpbs.org slash transit. Passengers traveling through the San Diego airport's upgraded Terminal 2 will find a security checkpoint that is bigger and designed to move people through the line faster. Unlike the checkpoint it replaces, the new screening area was designed for the job. We think that this is the first of uh, many uh, opportunities to really um, enhance the customer experience at San Diego Airport. This used to be the security checkpoint for Terminal 2 at the San Diego Airport. Now this is the new security area, an area that was built for the job. The upgraded security checkpoint is the first part of a billion dollar terminal upgrade that's open to the public. The old checkpoint was put in place after 9-11. It had six security lanes. This one can have up to 12. That's huge for transportation security officials. We went from 5,000 square feet to almost 30,000 square feet. So it gives us more room to do our job, gives us more room for all of our technology, and gives us more room for passengers so they can get through a little bit faster. The TSA's Nico Melendez says moving passengers through the line quicker is gratifying, especially with the possibility that federal budget managers could be cutting their resources. We don't know exactly what to tell our, our workforce, but for now, we have the staffing we need. We have not had a negative operational impact. Airport President and CEO Thela Bowen says the public is finally getting a taste of the airport's expansion. She likes what she's seeing at the new security area. Meters and greeters that are saying goodbye to their loved ones. It's so easy the way this is designed for them to stand and watch uh, people go straight through onto the other side of security. I really like, I like that because it says that we have done something that really makes the passenger feel warm and comfortable in this airport. A new ticket counter in Terminal 2 will open in May. The entire airport expansion is due to be complete in August. A new podcast helps San Diego victims of stalking and cyber stalking. Peggy Pico explains who's at risk and how to protect against it. 
The Sex Crimes and Stalking Units with the County District Attorney's Office just released an online podcast with expert advice on how to protect yourself from stalkers. Here with the details are County Deputy District Attorney Brian Erickson and Internet System Security Specialist and SDSU Professor Murray Jennings. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Brian, legally, when does behavior stop becoming persistent and turn into stalking? When it turns into a threat and when that person that's being stalked feels that they're being threatened or feels that a family member there is, is, is being threatened and the intent of that person is to threaten them. Uh, your department found that about 38 percent of stalking victims are actually ordinary citizens as opposed to celebrities or things like that. Um, what are the most common types, the three most common types of, uh, I guess, stalking threats uh, would these average citizens encounter? Sure, and obviously a direct threat. Somebody says they're going to kill you. Somebody says they're going to hurt you. A conditional threat, you do this for me, or, uh, you know, I'm going to, if you don't do this, I'm going to do this. I'm going to hurt you. If you don't could get back together with me, I'm going to hurt you, things like that. And then a veiled threat where it's a threat mostly known to that victim and not as obvious as I'm going to kill you or do this, uh, you know. What would, give me an example of that one. Um, a lot of it would be I'm going to, uh, you know, I know a lot about you. Um, yeah. Wouldn't that be terrible if your boss knew that? Okay. sort of that sort of thing where they're kind of threatening I'm gonna let this information okay. out on you. And that falls into stalking. And Murray, cyber stalking, we've all, uh, heard a lot about it. Tell us what it is and how prevalent is it? Well, cyber stalking is either using social media and the internet to find out information about somebody and then follow that up with physical stalking or it's actually just going online and posting information or misleading information about someone to harass them, to cause them to want to do something. And I wanted you to clarify this because yeah. uh, some people here uh, have gone on and looked up, uh, you know, a former roommate or former boyfriends. Is that stalking? No, and I've done that myself. It's when you look them up and then follow up with action after that that would cause the, the stalking to occur. Are there things you can do or are there programs out there to protect yourself from online stalking? Well, there are companies like Re uh, Reputation uh, Fixer who go out and will monitor for you. Personally, I, I Google myself every week or so just to see what's coming up. Oh, you do? Yes. You too? No. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Brian, now your uh, podcast offers very specifics on what to do if you're being stalked. And part of that you include a lot on having a detailed paper trail. Give us some of the suggestions you have and, and why do you need a paper trail? I, I always suggest that victims keep a paper trail because stalking goes on for a long time before it actually gets to the point where it goes to trial. And the more information we have, especially when you have veiled threats, showing why you feel, why this victim feels threatened or what this means to them, the better. So keep that journal of exactly what's going on, the telephone calls, the emails, the drive by the houses, things like that, and how you felt when that person did that, because that's one of the things I need to prove is how you felt, and would a reasonable person under those circumstances feel threatened by this person's behavior. And that would be helpful in, in legal issues later on? Absolutely, and plus it shows that it's repeated in one thing with stalking, it has to be repeated. You know, what, driving by someone's house once is not stalking. If you're there three times, be, you know, at 2.30 in the, at night, and you've just broken up, and there's been some exchange of bad words, that now you're getting into stalking ter type territory. Okay, and, and Murray, what about online? Should you keep the emails or the, save those pages or is oh, that absolutely. Dangerous? I would okay. s save your emails and keep them. Not a, I, I'd even take them off your computer. I would also, when you find a page or a posting, print it, keep it separate because they can go away. They can be removed. So you want to keep that digital record. And I think one of the things I also want to say is all of us like to be online and post stuff about ourselves. Only when so somebody starts stalking you should you start removing this behavior on your own. Quit posting pictures and quit uh, posting about yourself. All right. And um, Brian, who should you tell if you're being stalked? I would tell everybody. Um, you, obviously, you want to call the police immediately, especially if you feel threatened, but tell your coworkers, tell your neighbors, tell your child care providers, tell everybody because that stalker will go to all of those sources to get information on you. So the more they know, the more people know, the better because they can look out for you. It's another set of eyes looking out for you. Okay. And how about online? Is this, should you? Is there a specific place you can... Uh, you know, tell somebody about this? Well, you can post on your own Facebook page. You can post on Twitter that somebody's been making posts about you. Uh, it's difficult to go where they're all posting and make counter comments. It doesn't, it just promotes and encourages the activity. So I wouldn't say to go do that, to actually confront. 
All right. Well, uh, Murray Jennings and Brian Erickson, thanks so much for this. Now, I want to let people know that they can get more information on stocking by calling the number on your screen. That's 619-515-8900, 619 619-5 one five eight nine zero zero or go to kpbs.org for links to the podcast or other local resources and support it's illegal in san diego to smoke in a public park on the beach or even at a padres game but people can still light up on the campuses of the city's two largest universities, San Diego State and UC San Diego. KPBS South reporter Kenny Goldberg tells us that is about to change. At UC San Diego, students grab a quick smoke before hitting the books. Smoking is permitted on campus under certain restrictions. People can't smoke indoors or within 25 feet of an entryway. Smoking is allowed at this area near the library and parking lots and on campus sidewalks and pathways. That's all going to end on September 1st when UC San Diego will go completely smoke free. Karen Kalfas is in charge of all of the wellness related services for UC San Diego students. She says a few years ago some students came up with the idea of limiting smoking to just a few areas on campus. But then in 2011 there was a meeting at the office of the president for the whole system of the UC and we um, were discussing a different type of wellness initiative and smoking came up and the question arose why are we still smoking on campus and we all thought we shouldn't be. Calfus formed a subcommittee which produced a paper advocating that the entire UC system go smoke free. UC Regents agreed. Last January UC President Mark Udoff sent a letter to all school chancellors announcing the smoking ban. He gave the universities two years to prepare for it. Calfus says UC San Diego is ready to lead the way this fall. Smoking is the number one health habit that leads to the highest amount of morbidity and mortality. So the one thing people can do to protect their health the most is to quit smoking. So these are things that UCSD really values and we want to create a healthier environment for everybody who's here, both faculty, staff, students and our visitors. The situation is different at San Diego State. SDSU has 12 designated smoking areas. This one near the KPBS building offers benches and protection from the sun. One smoking area lies right in the middle of one of the most beautiful parts of the campus. Graduate student Shauna Dayan thinks it's a shame. Yeah, I think, I think that it encourages people to smoke in a comfortable environment and I think it also ruins the hill um, for the other students too. Dayan isn't some innocent bystander. She's a tobacco control advocate who's getting her master's degree in public health. But you don't have to be in graduate school to realize San Diego State has a major problem with cigarette litter. Last year, Dayan was involved in a special cleanup on campus. She says students collected 24,000 cigarette butts in just one hour. The butts are everywhere and they blend in very well and that they aren't biodegradable and that they are harmful and that people should not litter them. I think everyone knows that smoking is bad for their health. I don't think they also realize how bad it is for the environment too. Student Valentino Nguyen has heard all about the hazards of smoking. Still, he believes students should have the right to smoke on campus. If you don't like smoke, then just go away from it. It's, it's that simple? Yeah. I mean, this is everybody's air, you know? Nguyen says there's nothing wrong with designated smoking areas. Like you go to a library, it's supposed to be a quiet place. You know, you go to a smoke area, the smoke, and you just have to understand there's rules for every location and place and time. So there's a time and place for everything. San Diego State's Dr. Thomas Novotny doesn't see things that way. He's a former U.S. Assistant Surgeon General, and he worked on the International Treaty on Tobacco Control. Novotny says when it comes to protecting people from secondhand smoke, designated areas just don't cut it. But what we know does work is when you ban it completely. Going halfway doesn't work. And so that's why I think it's important to have a completely smoke-free campus and not designated areas. We, what we know is that it didn't work in restaurants, it didn't work in airplanes, it didn't work in work sites. 
The only way it really works is to say, look, there's no smoking here. And people change their behavior. In January, the Academic Senate of the Cal State System passed a resolution calling for all campuses to go smoke-free. The San Diego State University Senate will take up the issue this spring. Smoke-free campuses are not a new idea. For example, San Diego's Mesa College went smoke-free in 2007. Nationwide, there are more than 1,100 smoke-free campuses. UC San Diego's Karen Kalfas is looking forward to adding her school to the list. And I'm looking forward to a time when I can walk across campus and not smell smoke, and I'll be glad to have that for all of my colleagues and friends here. Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. A new report finds better acceptance of LGBT students in California schools than in years past, but there is still plenty of room for improvement. Peggy Pico finds out how San Diego schools compare. The Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, or GLSEN study, found of the nearly 1,000 California gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender students surveyed, 89% routinely heard homophobic remarks while at school. 37% are physically harassed, while 22% said their middle or high schools provide an LGBT-inclusive curriculum. Here with a closer look at how our county schools stack up are Colin Pierce of San Diego's chapter of GLSEN and 15-year-old Joey, a local high school student with some personal experience on the issue. Welcome. Thank you. Joey, tell us, you just heard those statistics. Has that been similar to your experience? Yes, definitely. I, I agree 100%. Um, You've been harassed at school? Yes, I've been harassed at school, mostly verbally and once or twice um, threatened physically to be harassed. Um, but mostly I hear is just derogatory terms all day long, at least two dozen times a day. For, for example, uh, you know, you're just general in general about being gay or, or? Or, yeah, just in general, that's so gay, don't act so gay, faggot. Um, how, how, do you, how have you responded to that? Have you told uh, uh, authorities at school? Have you told your teacher? Yeah, at first I, I let them know that it bothers me and that they do something about it and then they kind of forget later on, like a couple weeks later. And if I feel like I have to say something or go to my administration at school, I feel like if they would do something about it, the kids would know that I'm the one to say that because I'm openly out and all my friends support me. But some people who don't accept me for who I am may know that it was me who said something. Okay, okay, so we're, gonna, we're gonna come back to that as sort of the school's response. Colin, um, is Joey's experience as sort of verbal harassment here in San Diego schools, have you found that this is typical of uh, students who, who either come out or are suspected of uh, a different sexual orientation? It is pretty typical. Obviously, things will vary from school to school, from part of San Diego to part of San Diego, from school district to school district. But overwhelmingly, this this is pretty typical of what it's like for a student in San Diego. And it could be because they are actually LGBT, or as you as you indicated, it's also for students that are just perceived to be gay or lesbian, and and they can come in for the same kind of abuse. How does this sort of uh, abusive behavior or harassing behavior actually affect a student uh, at schools here? What, what is their effect on academia and them coming to school? Well, it, it manifests in several ways. One of the things is that we do see that grade point averages are lower amongst LGBT students who, who report being bullied. The other thing that we find is that they're much more likely to miss school. There's an alarming statistic within the survey that suggests that of those students who are interviewed, who were surveyed, one third of them missed a day of school last month because they didn't feel safe. Not just because they don't like going to school, but because they literally did not feel safe or, or included to go to, to go to school. This um, survey also talked about there has been some improvement uh, over the last 10 years, which I think is how long the survey has been going on. In 2011, I recall that Patrick Henry High School, um, the students there elected a lesbian couple as their homecoming king and queen. The superintendent of the district came out publicly, not only supporting the student's choice, supporting the king and queen, but also was very clear on that they are inclusive, they have an anti-bullying po policy. Um, what are schools doing in San Diego to, to improve the situation? 
Sunny Unified is definitely one of those school districts that's, that's ahead of the curve in terms of how they're responding. We're one of the community groups that have worked closely with them to, to create and implement their inclusive anti-bullying policy. And it, it, was, it was very pleasing to us to see that the superintendent, the deputy superintendent were, were personally involved. They were in the meetings. It was no surprise to me that Bill Cobus stood up and said that, 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 that the kind of abuse that those girls got, primarily from adults, not necessarily from children, was just not acceptable. And had it been from children within the school district, then they would have taken disciplinary measures against them. All right. And Joey, what would your, uh, first I want to ask you, would you come out again uh, with the behavior that's happened now? Would you be open again at school? And if so, what would your take home message be to other students? My take home message would be everyone's equal, no matter race, sexual orientation, what their favorite color is, everyone's equal to, in my eyes. And I feel like it should be that way in everyone else's eyes. And don't be afraid to be who you are. And you would come out again then? Yes, definitely. Okay. And we don't have a whole lot of time, but Colin, what kind of grade would you give San Diego schools right now in regards to their inclusive and in, inclusive programs? I would say it's very mixed. We have 42 different school districts, so it varies a lot. But I think there's an enormous room for improvement. We're, we're only just scratching the surface in, in terms of fixing this problem. All right. We are out of time. Thank you both so much Thank for you. talking with us. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour Supreme Court arguments over California's ban on same sex marriage, plus a deadly explosion in a Kansas grain elevator. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Cloudy to partly cloudy skies are going to stay with us for the next couple of days. Coastal temperatures in the 60s. It will be a bit warmer in the inland valleys, lows in the 70s, partly cloudy in the mountains. Desert temperatures also in the mid 60s. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks very much for joining us this evening. Have a great night.